Fun Ideas Productions presents the Fun Ideas Podcast. Hi, this is Mark Arnold, and welcome to Fun Ideas Podcast number 31. Alvin! The story of Ross Bag the Syrian Sr., Liberty Records, Format Films, and The Alvin Show is out. Order your hardback, paper cat paperback and ebook copies today on Amazon and at BearManorMedia.com. A reminder that I am scheduled to be on Stu's show live on April 24th discussing this very book. I'm also appearing recently on Phil Hall's online movie show to discuss it as well. I'm currently at work on the Total Television Scrapbook and I will give you more details about this in an upcoming episode. Our guest today is a musician, writer, and artist, and today we're going to discuss his new humor magazine, Freaky, as well as listen to some of his latest songs. Here he is, the slow poisoner, Andrew Goldfarb. Okay, so on the phone today, I have Andrew Goldfarb, a.k.a. the slow poisoner. How are you today? Oh, I'm not bad. It's a rainy Sunday in San Francisco, though probably not as rainy as, as your, your scene there. You're, you're in Eugene, right? I'm in Eugene, well, Springfield now, which is right next door. Um, right now it's not raining, but it's going to have a big cold snap starting in the morning, getting down to about 24 degrees, so I'm like, uh, not really oh looking forward God. to that. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and you, you grew up in Northern California like me, in fact, the same town, so you're not yeah. genetically equipped to deal with that kind of fluctuation no. in temperature, are you? In fact, the same school for time you know you're just a year or two younger than me but <laughs> that's a <laughs> podcast for another time about our uh, growing up years anyway <laughs> sunny saratoga california yes 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 and if, for those who don't know uh it's near san jose and if you do know well then you don't have to know that <laughs> so um so slow poisoner um Originally, well, let me have you start the story. So I, when I grew up with you, you, you were, the, the best I knew is you were the younger brother of a friend of mine named Ed Goldfarb, who was a musician in his own right. But did you have aspirations to become a musician or more of an artist or both? Because I remember you drawing cartoons way back. Yeah, uh, well, my brother was a musical prodigy. In <laughs> fact, he continues to be. He's now the... Um, soundtrack guy for Pokemon. Oh, wow. <laughs> I didn't that's even know that. <laughs> that's what he does. And so, um, yeah, he was a musical genius. And in the way siblings can be, uh, I had to uh, adopt my own uh, uh, area of expertise to compete. So I got into art. I had some natural ability at it, not the same way my brother was with music. But um, <laughs> I used to draw a lot of cartoons. I had... Uh, a kind of comedy superhero named uh, Super Funk that I would draw. He had a big F on his chest, <laughs> and um, I'm not not really sure what he was about beyond that. Um, but in some ways, my style has remained similar. I was really influenced by Mad Magazine, yeah. um, and so I think Sergio Aragonis and Don Martin were probably my earliest cartoon influences. So I was I was drawing as a kid. I was cartooning, and then. Um, I also had a real interest in horror films, which was inspired by um, two things, probably Famous Monsters of Filmland, yeah. uh, the first issue of which I got uh, while I was in uh, Foothill Elementary School, <laughs> and um, also uh, Creature Features was on late night television at that time, um, Channel 2. Yeah. ATVU it was all coming back to me. So I was into <laughs> horror movies for those two reasons. Mm -hmm. Not so much into music at that time. Uh, but it was actually by way of horror films that I got interested in music because I took a trip to Berkeley probably when I was about 13 or 14 years old and saw all the punk rock flyers that utilized horror imagery. Um, on the telephone poles, there was all kinds of punk shows being advertised, and one of the bands was Fang, um, <laughs> who turned out to be kind of no notorious. But their cartoon, their flyers had these cartoons of skulls, and uh, some other bands like the Angry Samoans used actual uh, horror film stills, and so it was on their advertising and their album covers. So it got me interested in punk rock because of the horror movie connection. Mm -hmm. 
And that was where, and then once I heard punk rock and realized, wow, anyone can do this stuff, uh, that's when I got the motivation to actually kind of form a band and uh, play the bass at first and then guitar and write lyrics and that kind of thing. So that's how I got into music, and then the art was a natural adjunct to that because I started drawing my own show flyers and band stuff, uh, and then in doing so, the art matured a little bit, got a little creepier, <laughs> I would say. Um, and the two have naturally gone together ever since. You know, any musical act needs a lot of uh art to go with it and so i've always drawn my own Mm -hmm. and um eventually kind of around the late 90s i got sort of serious about it in doing underground cartooning Mm -hmm. but at the same time i was doing music as well and then for the past 15 years or so they've become very entwined where the music and the art go together the art has a big role in the stage performance it's very theatrical i use a lot of props i build giant monsters and um some of the cartoons reflect uh themes that i address in the music as well in a way i'm just trying to get more for my money where if i have an idea i'll do it as a song and as a comic Hmm. and uh where I see a lot of your comics, and you've introduced me to this, is a, a freebie humor magazine, which I honestly don't know if it goes nationwide. It certainly does up here in, in Oregon and down there in California, but called Pork. And Which is no more, I'm sorry to oh, say. I didn't know that. I got like the 31st issue or something. I thought I just hadn't seen one in a while or whatever the issue was that I saw last. Oh. <laughs> yeah, so, so they stopped um, a few months back. They said they were stopping. Oh. And um, right after that, the poor editor had a stroke. Ooh. I don't think oh. it was related, but uh, he um, he died briefly and then came back to life. So he's kind of a superhero wizard in that respect. Wow. But I saw him a few weeks ago, and I asked what happened with Bork. And the problem was that they had no place to carry it anymore. So many of these small mom-and-pop stores, like the rock and roll boutiques and record stores and comic stores, have shut down in recent years due to Amazon, that there's no place to distribute a free weekly or get advertising for it. Wow. Or it wasn't weekly. It was a quarterly, but a free paper. (laughs) You know what I mean? Yes. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, and there used to be tons of free papers in the old days, like BAM and, you know, Tower Records Pulse. And, of course, there's no Tower Records anymore either, or any Bay Area Music Awards either. But <laughs> Yeah, Pulse was actually uh, – Tower Records was very important uh, as a distributor of small press because um, they had stores all over the country, and you could get your zine, you know, or weird comic or something um, distributed that way. It's uh, definitely gotten tighter in many respects to try to pull something like this off, um, although I am wading back into those waters doing my own uh, magazine, Freaky. Yeah, the- and in a way, I've picked up to some extent where some of that pork uh, vibe left off. I'm continuing my advice column, Ask the Slow Poisoner, and... Um, uh, finding a home for my cartoons and some of the folks as well <laughs> in that. But, yeah, Pork was great. It was it was an interesting uh, mag in that it also had one foot in the past. A lot of the graphics were reminiscent of the sort of 70s rock and roll style of kind of like the Ramones and Punk magazine, mm-hmm. uh, but definitely was covering a lot of uh, new stuff as well, mm-hmm. which... Uh, I thought it was really cool. I mean, it's always a question for me of how retro to be or how forward thinking. Yeah. Well, they even used the Piggly Wiggly Market logo, except I think they had an eye patch on them or something like that to make them <laughs> different. Is that correct? Oh, is that from Piggly Wiggly? Yes, it is. Yes, we're all West Coasters, but I do know about it. Yeah, it's an East Coast thing. So. <laughs> do they still exist? Is that? I don't know. Uh, somebody would have to tell me on that. I didn't know pork didn't exist, so probably Piggly Wiggly has gone the way of pork. I don't know. <laughs> I'll have to yeah, find it. One Piggly Wiggly in my life. It was probably while I was on tour and I was in whatever part of the country <laughs> has those. And I remember it kind of being like stepping back in time, which was cool. <laughs> So um, I guess, you know, we'll do it this way since uh, I kind of asked you beforehand, but we'll do it now. Um, Let's listen to one of your songs, and uh, maybe you could tell me about it. I actually, this might be my favorite one of the, you gave me about eight songs to listen to, and we're going to intersperse them throughout the show. 
Um, this one's called The Witches Are Watching With Their Thousand Eyes. And I actually like the beat. It's a, got a great beat. You can dance to it. Uh, it should be a number one hit on uh, American Bandstand next week. But uh, tell us a little bit about it. How did you come about with this uh, title? And uh, you know, that's, that's a Trump-inspired number. Or uh, more accurately, that was a protest sign at the first women's march that was what the sign read the witches are watching with their thousand eyes which i thought was just a great you know protest sign uh for the women's march uh probably whoever came up with that and probably owe them some uh, non-existent royalties <laughs> but uh yeah you know it's about uh grump and uh taking back the power you know and putting the, the feminine energy back in charge it was um inspired by that whole horrible horrible <laughs> world we're living in now <laughs> and all these songs we're going to listen to throughout the show, are they, they're pretty recent right they're from like the last year or two yeah, those eight are actually all new um, and they are yeah, I put out a tape cassette actually called a Mara Monster and it's got those eight on it and that was I think just last year okay, um, always there with the current technologies, the cassette tape but hey <laughs> Well, CDs <laughs> proved so unpopular. Um, <laughs> I that know, which is I weird. A few years back, and my theory on CDs is what did CDs in was the jewel case. Because you've yes. got this uh, sort of unpleasant plastic barrier between you and the item. And yeah. so no one formed emotional bonds with uh, CDs as a, as a thing. And I think if uh, people had gone with the cardboard case from the get-go, it maybe would have lasted a little longer. Um, but I noticed maybe five years ago uh, playing shows that a lot of the younger bands were having tape cassettes again because it was uh, something that, you know, had a more homemade kind of vibe to it yeah. and usually comes with a digital download. Um, actually, my tape, The Mirror Monster, is from a tiny label based right where you are in Springfield. They're called Captain Crook Records. Hmm. And they not only do tapes, they also do floppy disks. So if you want to talk antiqu antiquated technology, <laughs> you can get stuff on floppy disk. Um, but yeah, they put out lots of music and uh, really easy to work with. So they did that. Right. I will also mention another geographical connection here. Uh, the, the song you're about to play and, and half of that record is produced by another Saratoga alumni, Jeff Saltzman. Oh, wow. <laughs> So, <laughs> strong connection there. Um, so let's take a listen, might and, and yeah, then so I might just be close. <laughs> uh, we'll take a listen, and then come right back. So that was the song. That really, <laughs> like I said, that was my went favorite. Went by so fast. Yeah, I know. Went by so fast. Actually, that's one question I was going to ask you. A lot of your songs are only like 
two minutes or less, a lot of times less. Why, why is that? Is it just the punk vibe that you like to do short kind of songs? Uh, I I just think we need more short songs. <laughs> um, I really tend to dislike songs that are four or five minutes long. I feel like you're just not editing yourself. Uh, and then uh, most songs are about three and a half minutes. And it's kind of weird when you take a step back. Um, I mean, there's a lot of exceptions, but, you know, so much music gets made. So many people write songs, and so many of them are three and a half minutes long. Like, why Why is this happening? Is it really ideal? Yeah. And so I wanted to, um, you know, really just objectively think to myself you know what do what do i really want to do here and the answer was keep it short sam like two (laughs) minutes let's get in let's get out let's move on right it kind of reminds me not this last song or any of the other just the because they're short kind of the residents in a certain respect are you influenced by them or uh who are your influences a lot um the uh well let me think influences uh Going back, I mean, I'm influenced by a lot of sort of theatrical rock and roll. So Screamin' Jay Hawkins is a big influence. Mm -hmm. Uh, His English counterpart, uh, Screamin' Lord Such, is a big influence. Um, A lot of music from that era, 50s and 60s, music had to be short because the songs had to fit on a (laughs) 7-inch. So they tended to be uh, briefer. Um, I... Yeah, other other things I'm into. I like glam rock a lot. I think that's a big influence on the production on the song we just heard, the hand claps and kind of stomping beat. So I like T-Rex and David Bowie and, mm-hmm. and things like that. Um, I was influenced by punk, not so much by the music as sort of the uh, do-it-yourself attitude and um, kind of... Uh, budget rock uh (laughs) aspect of it of you know make it yourself sell it cheap and have fun with it um the doors were a big influence Mm -hmm. too for their kind of arty uh aspect and sort of moody vibe um and that tied in also with my horror movie interest i like things to be a little spooky around the edges Mm -hmm. i just think it makes uh, a more interesting lifestyle to have some ghosts and witches involved when you can yeah, so, yeah, garage rock, a lot of 60s influences, um, but the brevity, I just felt like it was, there are too many songs that go on a little too long. Attention spans are short these days, too, mm-hmm. uh, including my own. Mm-hmm. I think one way to work with that is to sort of keep stuff succinct. Mm-hmm. And I see a lot of Pat Boone influence on there, too. Pat Boone. <laughs> I don't know. I just read this really interesting article a while back about uh, people's opinions on whether you should be in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. And it was really divided, you know. Hey, if the monkeys aren't in there, you can't have Pat Boone. That's my opinion. But are the monkeys still not in there? Still not in there. They, ha- I the think, they all have to die for them to. Great, and I know you're a big monkeys fan, but of man, course. I mean, those records are are excellent, yeah. and they're so damn funny. I mean, the monkeys are just a great group. I feel like now, finally, I mean, when it's probably a little too late, they're getting the respect they deserve. You know, yeah. of yeah. not just being a a put together band, but hell, I mean, the Clash was a put together band too. Well, once I learned about the Wrecking Crew, uh, then I said, wow, all bets are off. I mean, monkeys and everybody should be in there. Heck, the shipmunks should be in there, you know, because it's like, uh, what difference does it make? I mean, all of them had the the Wrecking Crew band uh, playing on the back of their records, Sonny and Cher, Frank Sinatra, uh, Beach Boys even, you know, it's like, well, why are the Beach Boys in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame if you go by that, so. Right. Right, right. They are, right? The yes, they are. are. <laughs> yeah. The, the chipmunks should be, too. The chipmunks are amazing. Yes, and that's my next book, but that's another story for another time. <laughs> are you familiar with uh, Rocktober magazine? Have you heard of that? Yes. Jake Austin? Yeah, he was a big champion of the chipmunks and yeah. the monkeys. Mm-hmm. That, that magazine actually contributed to kind of widening my widening my own perspective yeah. as to what was good music. You know, I'd, previously I'd always dismissed things like Kiss, but mm-hmm. Rocktober makes good points about the enjoyability of some of these sort of less uh, esteemed artists. 
you know, well, I mean, my musical chase, it takes taste, chase, tastes <laughs> expanded since I was younger. I mean, you know, going back to the school days, you don't know this, but, um, you know, I, my biggest influences were 60s music and Beatles, of course, which I still love. Um, but that's kind of where it began and end. I was kind of like, you know, in the early 80s, I was like, the 60s music was it. There was nothing else that was any good. And, you know, and friends at school kind of teased me about it. And then I started picking up on things like Thompson Twins and Art of Noise. And people were like, what? Mark Arnold likes some current stuff? What is going on here? And I go, well, it, it sounds creative again. It's, you know, it's like, now I do respect 70s music and I do respect stuff that came out before and after and other genres now. But there was a time where I just said, ugh. 70s is all disco beat. I can't stand it. You know, and that's where my taste went. So, but. yeah, in the late 70s uh, were a little dodgy as far as mainstream music. And I remember that era of the early 80s. There was a lot of interesting things happening. And then towards the late 80s, it got sort of boring again. As yeah. We sort of yeah. gravitated back towards a Grateful Dead mm. slash punk rock the, aesthetic. It is the grunge, which is different than punk. And uh, let, let's listen to the next song on the album. Uh, well, I, this isn't really an album, but you gave me eight songs, so I'm calling it that. Um, are these in order of you know the uh, how they appear on the cassette, or no? Or are they just uh, random? Uh, if a Mera Monster is what you've got next, uh, then it's in order. It is. Okay, so right. this one's very punkish sounding. So is this uh, designed to be kind of a more punk rock sounding song? Yeah, again, influenced by recent events to some extent. So, uh, you know, a little anger seeped in. <laughs> and, um, you know, on any of these songs, what, what comes first, the, the words or the music? Usually the title comes first, oh, wow. like sort of the vibe of the song and the title, and then the music and the lyrics sort of come out of that slowly. Okay. Well, let's take a listen to A Mirror Monster, and then we'll be right back. USA is a haunted house Built on a burial ground Unfold a road map A black spot on a burial ground Get it up Get it together Dig it up and Dig it together 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 So that was a Mara Monster a uh, very punk sounding song by the Slow Poisoner. Um, any other words to say about that particular song? Well, um, this is from uh, last year, and uh, last year I did a tour of the Midwest. I got as far as uh, Michigan mm -hmm. from California, and um, I brought with me a uh, giant paper mache golem. Are you familiar with the uh, the Jewish myth of the golem? Yes, and I've seen that silent movie at least. I don't know if they did later versions, but I've seen that one. <laughs> yeah, that's a great movie. Um, that was a big uh, inspiration to me as a as a kid. And um, the myth is that uh, in medieval times, um, the uh, the Jewish village was threatened by the um, Eastern European government and under attack and. Um, to defend the village, the rabbi created a, a giant clay man mm -hmm. that he brought to life by inscribing mystical symbols on the clay man's forehead. And then things turn wrong, as it always does when you create <laughs> a giant monster. Yes. But uh, the golem was was a, a, a creation uh, with a defense in mind. And I made one myself out of paper mache and mm -hmm. it breaks down into little pieces and I would assemble it on stage in between songs and uh, it's the Amera monster designed to save America basically from 
uh, sinister forces within ourselves mm -hmm. and uh, had red and white striped uh, pants and uh, blue stars on his face and torso. And so this song went with that. Once the Amara monster is fully erect and comes to life with the glowing eyes, I launched into his theme song. Okay. I've seen photos of it. I haven't seen you in concert for a while, but it, it, it kind of resembles like uh, a, a, a robot or something like that. Kind of like Mar yeah. Marvin and Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy or something like that. That's what it kind of yeah, reminded yeah. me. Okay. All right. Yeah, it, it, the, the look of it has kind of a Jay Ward sort of style, so it's got that sort of cartoonish yeah, uh, yeah. Okay. history. So I, I noticed that, but I didn't know it was applicable to this particular song or if it was just something you just happened to pu pull out at one point <laughs> for entertainment yeah. value, but I guess it's for both, yeah. <laughs> yeah, a little bit of both. So you, you mentioned going on tour. Um, where do you typically tour these days? Uh, all over the country or just selected spots, or where do you go? Well, I've got a day job, so I don't do it all the time, but I tend to go out for two or three weeks during the summer. And lately I've been doing um, the same circuit each year because I've sort of uh, got the venues that I know and audiences that I know. And it tends to be um, like uh, around the middle of the country. I get out to Wisconsin and Chicago and uh, Michigan Kansas City, St. Louis, places like that. I also go up north to uh, Portland, and I go down south to L.A., So, and I get into Arizona a little bit, just anywhere I can kind of manage to wrangle a gig, really. Okay, yeah, because I've only seen you, I think, in San Francisco, So, and I know you've been up here, but, you know, Portland is still a couple hours for me sometimes, So, but one of these days I'll have to make... Make the point to go either north or south to see again. So. <laughs> yeah, I go to Southern Oregon. Uh, I do Medford okay. and Ashland. I've had a little trouble lining up shows in Eugene, but I uh, I'll keep at it. I mm. imagine eventually I'll be successful. All right, try the Wow Hall. <laughs> I don't know if you can get in there, but that's yeah. a little big. That's <laughs> more for the, yeah. the big name. I don't know. <laughs> well, I could have said the, what's that other place? I don't know. <laughs> the, the big movie theater, the big stadium up there. No, <laughs> I don't True. know. Anyway. Wild Hall is more accessible, but still not accessible to likes and be. But maybe someday. Okay. You never know. All right. Um, or there's the Hi-Fi Lounge. That's pretty small. There we go. Okay. but <laughs> I will make a note of that. Yes. The Hi-Fi okay. Lounge. We could talk about it offline. But anyway, um, I did want to ask you this before we play another song here. Um. So, you call yourself the Slow Poisoner, but you started out, you actually had a group, right? It was the Slow Poisoners, plural. And how did that come about, and why did it break up? Uh, well, it never really broke up. It just got ah. smaller. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and I like to, generally, I don't uh, give the whole story so people can just use their imaginations, being the slow poisoners and the band would link down. But um, around 1996, I started it. The, the name of the band came from a book, a sociology book from the 19th century called A Memoir of Extraordinary Popular Delusions and the Madness of Crowds. Wow. And it was about various instances of mass hysteria. There was a chapter on tulipomania and one on the witch trials. There's one on slow poisoning, which was this sort of faddish outbreak of murder that occurred in uh, France in the 1700s, mostly women doing away with their husbands since <laughs> divorce wasn't an option. But putting a little arsenic in the mm. crumpet on a daily basis would do the trick just as well. I decided it was kind of a wacky name for a group. Mm -hmm. um, and when it started out, it was a little more European influenced. I had a couple of cellos in the band, and it was sort of in the vein of the kinks or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, and the realities of keeping a band together and dealing with other musicians are such that uh, as people left or got fired, um, it became uh, easier to not replace them, and so there's sort of less hassle to deal with. This was really exacerbated when I started playing gigs out of town, because it's one thing to pull together three or four people to play a show, but to then bring them in a, in a tiny vehicle to some unfamiliar place under stressful conditions... It was just ridiculous. It was awful. Mm. So um, it went down to a duo for a while, and that was cool. But I also admired the singularity of vision that a one-man band can have where there's just no one 
if you get some fool idea in your head, like let's make a giant golem and take it on the road, there's no one to stop you. There's right. no one to say that's ridiculous, man. And as a result, you wind up doing more stuff. Uh huh. Now, did you come up, I, I, you know, with like you have kind of like this? Uh, you can explain it better than me because you, it's your, your your instrument. It's like a drum machine type instrument. Well, you just play a bass drum while you play guitar, or you know. But don't you have like like instruments you kind of created to kind of give the semblance of more players than you have? <laughs> if that's well, the um, the kick drum is just uh, a regular kick drum, but I've attached um, sleigh bells yeah. to okay. part of the the beater of the kick drum. So that there's a kind of jangling sound that occurs, almost like a tambourine is playing along. Okay. That's an old one-man band trick that another one-man band showed me how to do. Ah. And some people get really into it, and they'll have like shakers and stuff attached as well. Mm -hmm. But I found just a um, just some sleigh bells gives it a little bit more of a voodoo sound. Yeah, that's what I was implying. I was kind of driving at that because I remember that it wasn't just a beat. Um, you know, it had more of a sound than just one thing. So. <laughs> Yeah, there's also a technique I've kind of developed when playing the kick drum where it almost sounds like a kick and snare in that some of the beats will be louder than others. Oh. So you can sort of go with soft, loud, soft, loud, which is sort of like kick, snare, kick, snare. So it gives you a little bit of that rock and roll propulsion. Uh, it gets me out of the folk ghetto. Um, I discovered <laughs> early on that it's hard to get people to pay attention or care to anything, really, which is fair enough. But especially these days, people would rather just look at their telephones Ugh. in general <laughs> than do anything right so if that's going to happen um i need to pull out all the stops in order to at least use that phone to take a picture of me mm -hmm. which i have <laughs> <There you go. laughs> um let's look at one other uh look at i'm looking at it but we'll be listening to it i'm looking at the title um another song that's on uh, the new does this have an album have a name this cassette album uh, a Mera Monster. Oh, it is a Mera Monster. Okay. Yeah. Because we'll talk about all your other albums, or most of them, after this one. But uh, this one's called Garbage Groover, and there's a part of this I really like. It, it kind of sounds like it's done underwater or something like that. So um, let's listen to it, and then you can tell me after the song, you know, how you did that. I got a knife that's got it out. Big foil ball glows like the sunrise. Swag silk shirt for skeletons. Tin star, sure loser. Suck up the garbage groover. Flash crash, get sticky. Living in a hole is tricky. Yeah. Rolled up in a magic carpet ball. That drift along Asking can I get a dollar For this song Tin star Sure loser Suck up the garbage groover Flash crash Get sticky Living in a hole is tricky Tears fall dead in the eye. So that was the song Garbage Groover, and so yeah, there is a part of the song that sounds like it's underwater. How, how do you do those type of effects? That was studio trickery. Um, that, that you know, even I don't know really how that happened. Okay. Um, that was one of those um, moments where the producer, so to speak, um, just started twiddling some knobs and pulling out some weird boxes <laughs> and, uh, and made that happen. It might have been... Um, the effect of 
a rotating speaker, like a Leslie speaker. If you put your vocals through it, and John Lennon did this, I think, on one of the tracks in a revolver where it has that sort of underwater quality. So I think that's what it was. I think the vocal was fed through a Leslie. Okay. And the Leslie is a rotating speaker that people use with a organ to give it a kind of vibrato type sound. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah, because I'm always fascinated when sounds are done like this. I went to this radio convention uh, a few, well, I went to last year, but I went a few years ago as well, called Spurdvac. It's down in Southern California. And they recreate live radio performances on stage. And uh-huh. they did the shadow. And I never yeah. really thought about how the shadow's voice was done, but they have this special microphone attachment that makes them sound like, these, you know. The shadow knows, you know, I can't even do it, but you know, it's like, yeah. and I go, wow, that's really neat. So I'm always fascinated on real weird, interesting sounds on something, and so that's why yeah, I wanted to ask you about that. These days, a lot of that can just be done digitally. Yeah. You just dial yeah. up a, a plug in and it has the shadow setting. Right. But it's much more fun to do it for real yeah. if you can. Which is you what know? they did, I mean, and that's what they do. They have the sound effects. Yeah. They have people slamming a real door and uh, walking footsteps and gravel and right. stuff like that. So, um, Now, when you're doing your recordings, first of all, I guess you record in San Francisco at a studio there. Where do you record? Uh, I go all over. Um, the stuff that we're playing today, the first half was done in Portland, actually. Oh. Uh, Jeff Saltzman studio, and then the second half was done in Los Angeles at a friend of mine who had kind of a haunted house, and we set up in the living room and did stuff there, and that's got a percussion player on it as well. Hmm. And um, so you write all these all by yourself, right? Uh, or do you ever have help or anything from anybody else? I, because uh, I, you didn't give me any writer credit, so I wasn't sure if you composed yeah, them all yourself. Me. Those are all me. I do occasionally do cover songs, but none of these are cover songs. Right. But um, are you open to suggestion? Like when they did that special effect, was that the engineer saying, I think we should do this or something like that? Or you, you knew, you know going into the session what you wanted it to sound like? Um, that actually was, and it's interesting that we're talking about this particular part of the song. That was the... Uh, the engineer's suggestion okay. and actually i wondered if maybe it was too much that it was kind of distracting in its gimmickry but it you seem to like it yeah. so who am i to say <laughs> i tend to kind of go with the flow too unless it's something that i think is really barking up the wrong tree it's like oh that's fine i have uh, some idea of how i want things to sound but i'm not married to it um mm-hmm. because being a one-man band there isn't a whole lot of collaboration in general but in recording is actually one of the spots where i enjoy working with other people to bring it out occasionally i'll have other musicians play as well but especially with the engineer if he's got that sort of producer element where he makes suggestions about uh adding things i'm i'm always interested in in trying stuff out Mm -hmm. now um i was going through your discography and i don't know if i got all your albums you have quite a few i have a few of them myself let's see one two three four looks like you have about 10 albums but you can tell me how many you've had uh, uh, I'm not sure, but for a while I was putting something out every couple of years. Yeah. Um, so it's, uh, yeah, I think I've maintained like every two or three years I've been doing that. And so this would have been since before the turn of the century. Oh, okay. Uh, so they've, they've added up somewhat. I don't know if it's 10. Okay. Um, also, sometimes uh, the albums are short. Since my songs are only two minutes, you put eight together, it's only about 16 minutes <laughs> worth of. Right. music and um uh i think you know with uh digital streaming if it's eight songs or more they consider it an album uh-huh. so uh there you go mm-hmm. if you spend ten dollars on a slow poisoner album you get 16 whopping minutes wow but um <laughs> that's a good selling point <laughs> maybe you should put it on there in stereo and mono like some artists do <laughs> right anyway. right um <laughs> So was your the first album I saw? See, I was looking on Amazon. So if nothing, if everything's not on Amazon, even though we just dissed them for putting all these brick and mortar stores out of business, but uh, I was I walk a lonely road, or was that your first album, or is that the earliest one I found? That says two thousand three. That's what I was looking up. Uh, that's a song. Oh, that's on okay. An album, and no, that's kind of the midway point. Okay. Because I first. 
I did the first Slow Poisoners plural record in uh, probably 1998 okay. or 1999, and that one's a little hard to find because um, it was on some little record label that you know then imploded. Yeah. And I tend not to look back too much. I don't, you know, really re-release things. Um, so that one's a little rarer. But, um, yeah, every two or three years I was putting something okay. out. Um, it's gotten a little more mysterious now because <laughs> with the CD falling out of fashion, um, uh, you could make an album and just stream it, but then does it really exist? It's right, like, you know, right. And zeros floating in the ether, you know? <laughs> so I've been putting out, like, I put out four of these songs on the tape on a 10 inch record because oh. I like the feel of a 10 inch record in between the 7 and the 12. Mm-hmm. But it's the same four songs that are on the tape set. Of course, the tape set, there's only something like 50 copies. <laughs> um, so, you know, is that an album? I don't know. And I guess it really doesn't matter. Well, you could call uh, it an EP, but I mean, it's like, you know. Yeah. Which... Well, the EP is one of my favorite formats. Okay. Um, in the early 80s, it really came into its own, mm-hmm. where a lot of these new wave acts would put out four or five songs yeah. on a record. And I always thought that that was really cool. Um uh, maybe again, getting back to the short attention span thing, but just uh, do you really want to sit down and listen to 45 minutes of music? Um, <laughs> and you pay attention to the first few songs, and that's kind of like, you know, you're off uh, making your sandwich. Yeah. So uh, <laughs> I tend to record in little batches of four or five songs, too, because mm-hmm. they're usually the ones that I'm sort of. Uh, newer and more excited about and I'll record them while they're still you know in the set and interesting to me and then I guess just basically like I think now I'm just waiting to kind of like get rid of the stuff I've got and then make something new Mm -hmm. that's sort of been my philosophy about creation in general come up with something put a bunch of it out into the world and then when it's depleted Mm -hmm. do some more (laughs) so have any of the ones we played so far been on the 10 inch or no Yes, the first four are on the tent. Oh, okay. So then this last one, let's on listen vinyl. to that next, and then yeah. I'll ask you about that one. It's how you pronounce it, trilobite? Is that correct? Yeah, the trilobite is a, is an actual creature that's no longer on the planet, but was the dominant life form for most of uh, most of existence. Um, I, you would know the trilobite if you saw it. It's <laughs> I think it was maybe the first. I don't know. We'd have to look it up. It might be the first thing. So it's not a know. form of denture cream, huh? Okay. Um. <laughs> no, that sounds good. It's like a bug or a shellfish. Um, I think it was a. Might have been from the sea, but might have walked on land as well. There are tons of fossils of them still, and they came in all shapes and sizes. But the trilobite, the trilobite was a thing, man. Like um, <laughs> humans are nothing compared to the trilobite. We're like. We're just like an afterthought to the trilobite. The trilobite was, it's like the 78 record. I mean, mm-hmm. for most of recorded music, the 78 was the thing, right? For like yeah. 60, 70 years. Yeah. And then you screw around with LPs and, you know, uh, cassettes and CDs or whatever. But really, the 78, if you were to stop now in history and look back on recorded music, the 78 was the thing. That was most of it. Yeah. The trilobite is that to sentient life. <laughs> or I'm not sure how sentient the trilobite is. I, I don't think it was doing a lot of thinking, but um, <laughs> most of Earth time belonged to the trilobite. Mm. Now I'm not a scientist. I'll have to do know. more research on that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> which leads me to the question: You're mentioning 78s. So have you recorded any of your music on 78 just for a kick? <laughs> Yes. Oh, wow. <laughs> I did have one seventy eight made of a couple songs. Actually, I Walk a Lonely Road was one of them. We had a record release party for uh, a CD, but in order to, uh, or just as a joke, I brought up a Victrola and played uh, one of the songs from a 78. <laughs> How about cylinder recordings? Did it go that far? <laughs> What's that? Cylinder recordings? Solo? Uh, no, 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 that was the only instance. <laughs> No, um, yeah, it was like, um, where am I here? Um, so let's listen to Trilobite, <laughs> since I kind of lost my train of thought here. Okay. <laughs> Real. 
Trilobite, and um, the question, or the actual the thought I had about this particular one is, I noticed that there's a lot more instruments on this than some of the other tracks, where they're kind of sparse instrumentally. Um, do you play all the instruments when there's when there's a case like this, or do you have guest musicians come in, or both? Uh, a little bit of both. Generally, I'll play everything, but um, like in that case, the... Um the guitar line, the sort of avant-garde, sort of PIL-ish guitar, was the producer, Jeff Saltzman, played it. He just sort of heard that in his head, and I liked it. Um, I think probably everything else on there is me. When I'm in the studio, I'll, I'll do the basic tracks of the guitar and the vocal and the drum, and then listen back and think, well, what else would be good on this? And, uh, you know, bongos, tambourines. Uh, I've got, like, a box of sort of weird instruments um for example let's see here <laughs> let's listen to the sound of the vibra slap okay oh i've heard those <laughs> did that come through were you able to hear that yeah yeah it's kind okay, of a so that's the vibra semi-springy slap. woody sounding thing or something yeah <laughs> and it actually is made of some springy wood but interesting thing about the vibra slap the inspiration for it was the jawbone of a donkey and in fact i'm gonna play the jawbone of a donkey i actually i'm for real i have a donkey's jawbone here and i'm gonna play it for you hang on i'm gonna slap the side of it and the teeth are gonna rattle weird yep that also. was actual rattling teeth from slapping the <laughs> jawbone of a donkey. Yeah, it almost sounds like a rattlesnake, and you know, like it's slower, not so fast, you know. But if you shook it, I suppose it would sound kind of like a snake rattle or a baby rattle. Yeah, <laughs> and that was, I think, the idea. That was a folk, uh, a folk and country uh, thing, probably before the advent of recorded music or electronics. Mm -hmm. People would use that. Um, and one more to try out here. I'm going to play a few. The, the uh, inventor of the Viper Slap also created the Flexitone. I'm going to play that for you right now. Okay. Okay. How do they make that those? The I love that tone. sound. And, you know, it, that, they've used that for cartoon sound effects and everything. Yeah. How is that? Uh, what, what, what is it that's, like, metal that's bent? Or shaped some yes. funny way? Okay. Yes, you're bending the metal while these little wooden balls are striking it. So it's got uh, <laughs> wooden balls with on two little pieces of flexible metal around a larger piece of metal, and then bending that larger piece of metal gives you that sort of thereminish sound, yeah. similar to a singing saw. Same idea as the singing saw. Oh, okay. I should have you compose you. Uh, I, I should. Uh, bleh. I should have you compose me a theme song for my podcast here and put that yeah, in. Yeah, Flexitone would go well for fun ideas, I think. <laughs> so that's your next challenge. If you do it, I'll put it on there, and you know, I'll give you credit every week. But it's it's no 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 uh, no pressure <laughs> if you want right to do on. it. Because originally I did have a theme song at the very beginning, and then you know when I started posting these on YouTube, it's like then they start saying copyright, copyright infringement. Oh uh, like, yeah. Because I was using uh, Stomping at the Savoy. Uh, I picture Raymond Scott being up your alley. Yes, I like Raymond Scott stuff, yes. <laughs> and they used a lot of that in Ren and Stimpy cartoons, the original stuff. So, yeah, yeah power, uh -huh. Powerhouse and Little Tim oh, yeah. Trumpet or whatever it's called. Um, okay, moving over to second side of the Ameramonster album. Now, these are only available on Ameramonster, you're saying, on the cassette, right? Uh, that's right. Or I guess streaming. And now, how would they get them yeah. streaming? Are you on? You said Spotify and stuff like that. Uh, yeah, I don't think Spotify's got this one, but the record label in Springfield put it out on Bandcamp, so Bandcamp has it. Okay, all right. It's it, that's the thing that's frustrating to me is like things. There's so many different formats, not just you, but other other artists as well. It's like, well, you got the album, but if you want this song, you have to do a digital download. And if you want this song, you have to go buy it at Target. And if you want this song, you have to go over to iTunes. And it's like, uh, just put out the entire album, please. <laughs> <laughs> well, 
And I probably will eventually. <laughs> uh, and um, big artists I, do that too. I mean, it's like, you know, we're talking about cassettes here. Um, McCartney did uh, the Flowers and the Dirt remaster, and some of them were only available on iTunes, some of the other alternate tracks with Elvis Costello. And then there's one, he had the audacity, we're talking about cassettes, he put out only on a cassette, which I have, and I was like, why? Why did you do that? Why didn't you put it all in the same format? But uh. Now, was that a recent cassette? Or yes, it was. It was a recent cassette. It was really? put out on Record Store Day. It's kind of hard to find now. Oh, it was put out well, on a so cassette yeah. <laughs> by Paul McCartney and Elvis Costello. So, anyway. Well, generally, these songs that are only in one format or the other are not masterpieces, yeah. so to speak. <laughs> you know what I mean? They're more sort of collector's items yeah. or like kind of in the moment sort of fun stuff. I think part of the reason for all this is that it has become sort of decentralized where there isn't one dominant format anymore. Yeah. So um, you can either throw up your hands and put out the same thing in every single media or uh, put a little here, put a little there. I right. mean, I think uh, <laughs> the kids today are basically getting their music from YouTube. Yeah. And so that's another thing I've gotten into is making little videos for most of these songs. Yeah, which is why I put these podcasts on YouTube, too, because I realized, you know, I have right. to convert it to an audio file that's special for YouTube because they're designed for video, but hey. Ah. <laughs> Do you what do you what is on the screen? Do you put some stills up there? I just, just put a general graphic? still of uh, fun ideas light bulb logo. Um, right. I could be more adventurous, but nobody's paying me to do this, so uh, no, you just get the still thing, and it's really just designed to listen to. So uh, right. maybe someday if this made money or something, you know, I might get a little more adventurous doing this show where we're uh, actually. Uh, playing some music is actually the most adventurous show I've done so far. Usually it's All just right. a Q&A, so thank you for expanding my horizons here. But that's the whole idea. I mean, you know, I've never had it totally uh, locked into place. That this is what Fun Ideas Podcast is. I mean, I would love to do a radio show reenactment or even a, a completely new script you know i could do all the voices oh, yeah. myself or i could have a cast where like you and a couple others would be doing oh, yeah. the voices or something in live music who knows so that'd be great but for now <laughs> this is what it is but uh so the next song uh i, I said the witches are watching with their thousand eyes is one of my favorites so this one's actually another favorite that i really liked is called eviction notice have you been evicted? Is that why this came about, or is that a different inspiration? <laughs> um, well, it's always on my mind, living in San Francisco, where the rents are astronomical, and the reason I'm able to survive here is through rent control. And my landlord is not a greedy man, so things are working out okay. But I've been in the same place probably for almost 20 years, and I will never move, yeah. um, at least not within San Francisco. Um, the uh, I'm, I'm paying, you know... 1995 rents basically with a little cost of living increase that they can do mm -hmm. but that's how i'm able to survive and a lot of people in san francisco as well the song um is a little surreal i think the only reference to eviction um actually has to do with being evicted from the planet yeah. but um <laughs> yeah. just the the thought of eviction is something that sort of is on our minds yeah. here in, in sf but most of these lyrics, uh, they'll have some sort of real-world yeah. inspiration, but then I will let it go into a kind of a nonsense realm because uh, the nonsense realm is the realm that I enjoy the most. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, you mentioned for, like, uh, Mirror Monster, you have the, the Gollum and everything. Uh, what are you doing on stage when you perform any of these other ones? Does this one have any sort of special visuals or anything yeah. like that? Uh, and I don't do it anymore, but what oh. it had <laughs> was a giant painting uh, of a crab monster. It was actually from a horror movie, I think, called The Black Scorpion. And I just loved the look of it, and I painted it, and what I would tell people was that that was my landlord. And then I'd play Eviction Notice, and it always got a laugh. But in reality, my landlord's a really nice guy. <laughs> and then you just stopped using it because it was too big of a prop to haul around, or...? 
you just change? Uh, no, I just keeping things fresh. Um, every year, I like to change the set at least somewhat. And I had spent a couple years with these large paintings that accompanied the songs, mm -hmm. and so it was time to retire that. And they were getting beat up, and I think I gave most of them away at my last show. Oh. Um, and now, what I've got is an obelisk that uh -huh. I wrecked on stage. Or at least that's the idea. I've only tried it out once, and it was a little problematic. But I'm gonna hang in there. Where um, I have images on these large blocks that I display uh, and as uh, the set progresses the blocks stack onto each other to create this large sort of pagan edifice yeah <laughs> <laughs> so you say yeah like oh yeah of course <laughs> <laughs> so, so let's listen to eviction notice and come right back Snorts fire. She made a bracelet from your bones. The demon bolt snorts fire. She made a bracelet from your bones. I got an eviction notice from this world. I got an eviction notice from this world. This world. Scorpio. Black rainbow, whoa, whoa, got to go. Black rainbow, whoa, whoa. Yes, we're bloodless, that's why we want yours, that's why we want yours. Yes, we're bloodless, that's why we want yours. Why we want yours Jealous claws of singing stars Jealous claws of singing stars Scorpio Black rainbow Whoa, whoa Got to go Black rainbow eviction notice one thing we were talking about right before it um just what you do on stage do you still do the bit which i always liked um kind of like a, a throwback to vaudeville days you put the the name of the song on an easel so like everybody knows what song you're playing during the song and then you changed it up for each song. you know i haven't been doing that one okay. Okay. but i am thinking about going back to it because one thing that was nice about that was then people could ref they knew what the name of the song was and afterwards they could say hey i really hated that song that was called blah 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 because <laughs> i always liked it i thought you know that's a good idea you know it's like because half the time even a band you know it's like yeah what is this song i can't remember and it's like it, you know unless you're up at the stage and you can see the set list by his foot or something usually you don't know you know what somebody's playing you know yeah and it also i think it sells a little more merch because then people know the name of the song and if they want to buy an album they can see whether it's got that song on it you yeah. know so i recommend bringing that back to the act if you, you know the last time you did the act you did well it also made for good photography because when i was taking photos of you performing then hmm what was he doing here with that crazy mask on oh he was performing this song okay got it right <laughs> So the next song on the album, let's just go to another one here uh, that I also like, is uh, Gruesome Globs. Now, what was the inspiration for that? <laughs> um, I did these series of paintings where these large blob monsters were sort of looming over um, people that I found in old photographs. And I would tell this little story, and I made a little booklet of it, too, getting back to the sort of the cross-pollination of um, my uh, art and the music and the comics. And actually, now it's a comic strip that's ongoing about gruesome globs. But just the idea of these horror blobs, like, mm -hmm. they're really fun to draw, you know, because it's just this globulous thing with eyeballs. And I did these paintings of these large globby horror creatures 
sort of dripping on to like a little girl playing with her beach ball and um some businessmen and this sort of angry guy and these i would just talk about the gruesome globs and i made some sort of weird connection with uh how people are afraid of immigrants mm-hmm. i don't remember how that played out but i, I dragged politics into it somehow it was around the same time as the uh Trump was locking up children in cages, which he's probably still <laughs> doing, but uh, somehow I, I dragged gruesome globs into it, this sort of fear of the unknown other. So this is a very Trump-inspired album, then. It's kind of... It, do you always have a theme on your albums? Or in, in this case, obviously, you know, a lot of things are what's going on currently politically, but... Uh, um, I guess... Uh, you know, it reflects what's on my mind. Like, I'm doing a bunch of stuff now that gets into uh, climate change and global warming because the idea that we're about to die uh, horribly and that we can stop it, but we're not going to. Yeah. Um, you can't. I can't really get that out of my mind entirely. So yeah. I'm turning it into, um, you know, little tunes and funny jokes. To fun, happy songs. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I've got one now called Hot Horror Planet. Okay. In fact, just this morning, I was painting on the obelisk my image for that, which was this sort of, like, uh, fearsome anthropomorphized uh, planet Earth with uh, a whole lot of fire. Okay, well, let's take a listen to Gruesome Globs, and we'll be back in about a minute and a half. So that was Gruesome Globs. Um. <laughs> yeah, I want to mention that background vocals on there and bongo playing is from my friend John Skip, mm-hmm. who's actually a uh, well-known horror author. Um, he helped direct the um, Hot Rod Worm video, which I did a while back. If you Google Hot Rod Worm on YouTube, you can see it. Mm-hmm. And uh, he's been in, uh, in the horror business for a long time. He actually co-wrote one of the uh, Nightmare on Elm Street films. Hmm. Uh, leave me to a different question. It's like, you, you know, you have the horror background. Also, listen to a podcast. It'll be probably aired by the time we get this one done. Um, is with Bill Shelley. He just recently did a book about uh, Jim Warren, who published all those things, Creepy Eerie, Vampirella, Famous Monsters, and everything like that. So I did a oh, link, lengthy interview with him. But anyway, do you ever get a chance to attend any comic book conventions or monster conventions or anything even as just a patron oh yeah definitely um well what i frequently do is sort of a lower key thing like zine fests or sort of little local comic cons which i'll table at and sell stuff Mm -hmm. um i'm a regular attendee at one in portland called bizarro con which is a little more specialized to a certain uh niche of uh horror literature called Bizarro and uh, one of the publishers has put out a number of my books and um, um, I've done uh, 
uh, San Diego once, the big Comic Con. Yeah, I know I you did. A, well, I know scale. you did Ape in San Francisco. In fact, I think we sat close by each other. Yeah. Oh, uh, that's right. That's right. That's right. In fact, yeah, I, you know, you offered me a book and I failed to take it, and I oh. think it was the cracked one. So, if you still got copies of that, man. I do. Um, <laughs> I would, I would love to get that. I don't know. I think I was I was um, sh- stunned by your generosity and failed to take advantage of oh, it. Okay. But, um, <laughs> yes. On the rare occasions when I'm generous, don't 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 <laughs> don't uh, turn away. <laughs> well, it's a big book, and yes. it just seemed like too large a gift. But okay. uh, I. Yeah, especially now that I realize how much of Cracked is reprints, it would be good to know yeah. what's what. Well, it does have a checklist in there, which some people hate. If you look at my reviews on Amazon, some people say, it's all it is is a checklist. No, it isn't all a checklist, but it has become very handy once people start using it and when they collect back issues. Is this all reprints or all new? But the, 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 right. the, yeah. And if you get the ebook version, it's searchable. But uh, uh, en- enough plugs for myself. We're back to you. Um, um, yeah. So I am interested in doing that kind of thing. Um, I, you know, some of them are very expensive to table at. Yeah. Um, by Ape, I think was like three hundred bucks or something. It's hard to make your money back. Yeah. Uh, and I think Ape is no more. Uh, well, yeah, I don't know if it's – yeah, it, it went back and forth. I knew it was part of San Diego for a while, and then I think they gave it back or sold it back, however they did it, back to Dan Votto, who, who oh, originated Oh, so maybe it. it exists and it's just done by slave labor. And um, I think I'm, I'm the sure. last year is down in San Jose again, not up in San Francisco, so uh-huh. I don't know, but, you know. Okay. So I'll have to look at that. Yeah, if you hear good ones, too, let me know, because okay. now that I'm doing Freaky especially, yeah. I want to hit these up. Because my goal is to get at least 500 copies of uh, free, of each issue of Freaky out into the world, which I think is not going to be too hard to do. Well, let's talk but, about uh, Freaky for a second. So, yeah, you you got, you said you were kind of inspired because I did a comic magazine once called Frolic just for fun. Yeah. But, I mean, you know, I would love to do that regularly, but, you know, there's no real money and uh, or time, you know, but... You know, you draw a lot more than me. That was a big labor of love because I did basically 52 pages all by myself, and it was only oh, because yeah. I couldn't get somebody to draw it for me. So I right. said, I'll draw it myself, said the little red hen, and I happened to be between two books. But, uh, you know, I, might, I, I probably will do another one. But uh, I don't know if you're familiar with a guy named Mike Cazala. He's done some covers for my books, and he's an animator. He animated on Ren and Stimpy and other shows and stuff in the past. But... Uh, he did Zorch comics, and he had 20 years between the first issue and the second issue or something. <laughs> so I figured, hey, I can I can uh, take a little time to do oh, the, my yeah. next issue. But anyway, so uh, totally. going to Freaky, so h- how did that come about? Because, I mean, you had had your stuff in Pork. Is it because Pork folded that you no, decided to do this? No, that was a coincidence. Um, that was just a coincidence, but I think I was inspired somewhat by Pork. I really like the way Pork balanced retro elements and current elements it sort of harkened back to a kind of late 70s rock and roll aesthetic but it was really uh of of its time as well and with freaky um i was inspired by a few different things but one of them was an english comic from the 70s called Shiver and Shake. Are you familiar with English comic books at all from the UK? Some, but more like the Beano, Dandy, those types. That's what I mean. Actually. Oh, okay. Yeah, Beano you know, and Dandy. And it's, a weird, it's weird how those humor comics in, uh, in England grew up in a different way. Like they were weekly. Yeah. You know, and um, the, um, the one I'm referring to, uh, Shiver and Shake, was all kind of funny monster stuff. Hmm. And... Um, I realize that you know that's that's what I like, funny yeah. monsters. You know, like with Cracked, the um, the monster issues were always my favorites. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, but there isn't a whole lot of stuff like that being published, to my mind anyway. But a lot of people I knew were drawing things like that, were drawing funny monster stuff, and so it occurred to me I could just put this out uh, myself. There's plenty of people that are drawing things that I like. Mm-hmm. There's just not really a place, you know for a home for them to be in Mm -hmm. and um i was also inspired by plop you probably know plop oh yeah published by dc in the 70s google it everybody anyway yeah so plop (laughs) was uh you know it's sort of the same idea like sort of funny monster stuff a little surreal a little black humored um and also some gag cartoons and it was hosted by um 
the uh, a trio of, of witches and warlocks that Sergio Aragonese drew that I think came from House of Mystery yeah. originally. But that, that idea, and then the mascot concept is also, of course, a thing with the humor magazines, like Cracked and, uh, and Mad, obviously. Right. And so I thought to tie it all together, it would be cool to have um, – you know, a character, and I took the look of the magazine from the sort of uh, humor mag world with the logo and and the mascot and the painted covers. Mm-hmm. So that was definitely uh, a homage to Cracked and Mad and Sick, which is actually my favorite. <laughs> um, and so the idea of doing. Um, I eventually landed on doing it annually because that seemed to be a, the amount of time and money I could afford to put into it. With print on demand, in a way, things have gotten so much easier because I don't have to do a thousand or two thousand copies right. and have stacked to them sticking around. Because I didn't want to deal with Diamond or something like that. Have you ever dealt with Diamond? Like, I don't think I'd ever deal with Diamond again. Well, I used to, but yeah, that's a long time ago. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, who wants who wants that? Yeah, <laughs> I mean, I did I did my Harveyville Fun Times for 21 years and 75 oh, yeah, issues. Yeah, yeah. So you yeah, know about so. this. And then I stopped, uh, and then you know the Prolix thing kind of came out of left field, and I did that, and that's the last thing I published. But you know, <laughs> right? Um, so, but I figured like moving like 500 down to the world somehow I could do, you know, uh, just doing these little little uh, comic cons or. Um, playing gigs selling it you know out of my merch box i always found that selling comic books and especially paintings was a much easier sale than cds hmm. or, or even records uh, i took up velvet painting as well which we can touch on <laughs> but um yeah so i got a couple of other or about 10 other people to contribute um and put out the first issue of freaky mm-hmm. and that was only a few months ago but yeah. i'm planning to do it again at the end of the year and you had well, other thank people. You for, um, thank you for posting that on the uh, on Facebook as well. Yeah. I got a number of people that were really into it from there. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, I'm posting regularly on the Cracked magazine page, and everybody goes, what happened to Cracked? Do they publish anymore? No, they don't publish anymore, and there's probably no chance of it coming back anytime soon. But my friend uh, Andrew here, who's the Slow Poisoner, he published something, and then I just put it on there, and, like, people went nuts. They said, Wow. I want one, so I know you got at least like five or six sales from that. I don't know if you got hundreds, but you know, hey, anything I can do to help, yeah. you know. Uh, I appreciate it. I mean, one thing I don't get into is satire, so to yeah. speak. Um, because that, to be honest, that was an element of those magazines that I never really liked too much because this sort of like making fun of things in the popular culture. Things in the popular culture aren't necessarily deserving of any more attention. So to sort of spoof current movies and current, you know, singers and trends, it just didn't appeal to me. Well, also, it's kind of easy humor in a certain respect, you know. I think so. I mean, as much as it's fun to to bash Trump, it's easy to bash Trump. And that that is kind of like a little bit of a hang-up about current mad, you know. It's like they do a lot of Trump bashing, and it's kind of like... Okay, we get it. He's kind of a a, a, a boorish guy, and he, he's easy to make fun of. But kind of move on. You know, Mad used to be a little more innovative. Come on, you know, it's like, you know, yeah. of course, of course, the hardcore I, Trumpers say this, which I think is hysterically funny. I used to buy Mad when it wasn't so liberal. And it's like, when was Mad not liberal? Right. <laughs> you know, it started that way. It was supposed to be uh, anti-establishment. You know, but hey. Uh, um, yeah, uh, well, I think, Bill, since the reboot, I think Mad is looking pretty good. I think I, I uh, do like the current issues, but, you know, they kind of, you know, uh, get a little Trumpish again. But, you know, it's okay. You know, Bill Morrison's a friend of mine, and I like what he's doing. And, uh, you know, I like it that they actually, like in the current issue number five, he, uh, they, they said, well, we never did a parody of A Christmas Story 32 years ago, but we're going to do one now. And I said, I like that. You know, they don't have to stick. Yeah with established stuff and uh you know they did a parody of archie in the first issue which kind of became a you know i know i know you were saying i don't really care for the parodies and satire so much but you know that's kind of mad's bread and butter it doesn't have to be sure and either. i think it's great doing classics like that or like the svengulli one they did where they touched on a number of different 
horror elements. Uh, I prefer that to the very specific ones where they're just going after one movie. Personally, I think they can drag Drump through the mud as much as they want to, and I will dig it because that's a special situation, and they do it so viciously that I think it's great, but that's my opinion. Yeah. Um, but for anybody who says, well, why don't they do it on Hillary? Well, they have put Hillary on the they cover. Do. But when sure. she was running for president, now she runs yeah. again and becomes the front runner. Then, yeah, they'll drag her through the mud again. <laughs> no. yeah. But it'll probably be somebody else because Hillary's kind of had her day. But anyway, not to be political. Uh, <laughs> let's let's do a song. Hey, <laughs> okay. Um, the next song in the album, we're almost to the end of the songs here, uh, Candelabra Cadaver. And uh, this almost reminded me of Casanova Frankenstein, you know, in title at least. But uh, where did you get this one out? Uh, what you mean Casanova Frankenstein, the artist? No, no, no. Casanova Frankenstein was in uh, Mystery Men. Yeah, it was, uh, I think that was the name of the character. The, the bad... No, tell me more. What is this? Because I know a guy that goes by the name Casanova. Yeah, well, it's from Mystery Men, the movie, which Mystery was a comic book. Yeah. Ooh, I don't not sure I'm familiar with it. Uh, when, when was the film? About 2003 or something like that. Well, maybe I did see it. Was it, a, like a, was it a superhero spoof? Kind of, yeah, sort of, yeah. Okay, maybe a John Buscemi or someone like that? I think he's in it, yeah. And okay, uh, William H. Macy it. and... Uh, of an impression. Um, I can't even think of the actor's name um, uh, who played Casanova Frankenstein, but I always like that name. Anyway, so I thought uh, of that one. About, it's about Liberace. It's about Liberace, okay. It's about Liberace. <laughs> now, why? <laughs> I'm a big Liberace fan. Ah, I think okay. Right. Fascinating. Uh, I think his music is great. I, I'm into his whole shtick. Um, in Vegas, there was a Liberace museum that I visited, and uh, just so crazy. Um, yeah, so it's a Liberace song. And it, one of the neat things, <laughs> when I played this on tour this last year i wore a candelabra on my head <laughs> while i would do this which was kind of uncomfortable and ungainly and didn't always work but the idea was uh, to wear the candelabra while playing the song and one of the gigs that i played just by coincidence was a, th- a little club in La Crosse, wisconsin where it turns out liberace got his start oh, so huh. i was able to play the song with the candelabra on my head at the place where it all began wow did you and you didn't know that, or and you just going into it? I did not know. Wow, <laughs> there's synchronicity for you. <laughs> yeah. All right, well, listen to that and come back in a moment. Still burning in the attic of a dead man's chest, secret threads. A sea of shining teeth, a glittering shirt sleeve, lace to rhinestone kisses. So that was Candelabra Cadaver 
uh, inspired by uh, the great Liberace, <laughs> who was Shandell on Batman, if you don't remember. Oh, really? <laughs> yes, he was a Batman a villain. Show? How oh, dare you? You haven't seen that? Yes. Uh, he I played. have a long time ago. Yes. But, uh, In fact, oh, he played okay. his twin brother. <laughs> So he was actually a pretty versatile actor, considering, you know, that people just kind of dismiss him as being kind of campy. Um, he did a good job on it, strangely enough. Um, wow. the, the thing that I noticed on this is there's a lot of harpsichord on this one, which I love. Um, did you play the harpsichord? Yep. Okay. And <laughs> that's all you want to say about it? No, what, what was the choice? I guess because now I know that it was Liberace inspired. Yep. Was that the reason? Just to yep. kind of get some sort of piano type sound, as it were. Exactly. Yeah. Keyboard type sound. That's. What and I, I love the sound of the uh, harpsichord. You know, um, it had its day in rock and roll in the '60s. Right. Um, it really has not been revisited since, but I think it's just a great sound. Now, are instruments like this readily available in uh, the studios when you record, or do you have to bring these instruments in? Um, the harpsichord can be replicated digitally. Um, okay. I, on occasion, you get your hands on, you know, some version of that that's an actual keyboard. But generally, you know, it's all samples these okay. days. Okay. I love using the real stuff if I can find it. And sometimes the studios will have, like, an old organ or piano or something. Yeah. But uh, harpsichords are a little more rare. Okay. My, um, my brother had an electric harpsichord for a while, similar to the kind Elton John would use. Hmm. So they're out there, but it's not as, you know, people don't really have room for that kind of thing. Right. Did you ever uh, play or find one of those ones? I don't even know what it's called, but McCartney has always shown it. It's that, oh, Mellotron, you know, that had the little oh, yeah. pre-recorded bits on it, like yeah, for Strawberry Fields. Yeah, the real fields. Mellotron is an unwieldy beast because it's actually got a tape loop for every key that plays. Oh, wow. <laughs> Yeah, I had one briefly, and it was just a nightmare to maintain. I couldn't do it. And so it went out of tune, but it sounded kind of amazing when it was going out of tune because it sounded like a dying, you know, <laughs> organ. Um, and there was a choral sound that, as it was going out of tune, just sounded like a dying church full of oh, wailing wow. people. It was amazing. But, yeah, the Mellotron's an incredible instrument. But nowadays you can, you can do that with a digital sample yeah. easily. I've even got a Mellotron app on my phone. Oh wow! Okay. recordings. Because it's hard for me to imagine how it kind of worked. Because, like I said, you know, they always show McCartney saying, oh, "This is how John played uh, Strawberry Fields," and it'll just do yeah. the beginning. And it's like, well, that doesn't really explain how it works. I'm like more fascinated than that. Yeah, you know? there's a tape loop. It's like thirty. It's like sixty different tape players. Yeah. That's if you watch it go inside. Yeah. Uh, you press the key, and it's running a loop of tape. So it's just the same loop because he did do kind of a on the one I saw a little demonstration where it's just like this grooving kind of like that over and over and then you yeah. can change the pitch or whatever. That's that right. And essentially that, that's how it works. Okay. Loop okay. For the other keys, but yeah, it's the same sound warbling over and over. I think it sounds better than the real thing. I think it sounds better than a string section. Hmm. And um, yeah, I mean, Led Zeppelin used that on Cashmere, I believe. Oh, yeah. It's yeah. Uh, it's a classic. Okay, well, more Mellotron from you. you got to do another Mellotron song at some point. Sure. <laughs> That's my request. Um, one last song, and then we'll cover a few other things that you've done. Um, so the last song, which has another cool title, uh, Rose of the Tentacle Pages. What inspired this one? <laughs> uh, well, Rose is an actual human being, and she was an editor of this, uh, or is an er editor of a book publisher called Eraserhead Press, named mm -hmm. after the, uh, the Lynch film. And she published a number of my books, and the, all the lyrics in the song are titles of different books that she or people uh, that she's friendly with have published. Uh -huh. So it was, um, it was easy to write in that respect. Okay, because uh, there's a few lyrics I was going to ask you about, and I'll ask you after we play the song here. This eggshell earth Splits open On the feathered wing of a unicorn Pink rose in the pages Slithering tentacle caress 
in a house made of houses where the wolf woman says mm. mutant sex monsters rise up and take Take over in this skull crack city. There's a light at the end down a haunted vagina with the ass goblins. And in a town called Suck Hole, full of mystery meat, ride a unicornado through trash land to go. Uh, Rose of the Tentacle Pages and so here's some lyrics that uh, I listened to uh, one was Haunted Vagina is there a book called Haunted Vagina there is and it's by oh Carlton, Carlton Mellick the third and it's a great book it's a touching book uh, I bet no, I'm just kidding. Like, <laughs> I totally recommend it Carlton Mellick the third He's, uh, he's been writing weird books for many years, and he's actually how I got involved with this particular uh, publishing imprint, because um, we were published in uh, the same zine back in the real zine heyday of uh, the mid-90s, mm -hmm. and uh, he started this press, Eraserhead Press, with his wife Rose, and um, he, um, he also wrote a book uh, called The Baby Jesus Butt Plug. <laughs> it, it, I strongly recommend you look him up on Amazon. They've got all his books. Okay. Uh, Carlton Mellick the Third. Um, he does not disappoint. <laughs> and then another uh, lyric I caught, uh, which I guess is a book, uh, tr trash trash can a go go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> that is a book by um, uh, Constance. Oh, her last name's escaping me, but it's really good. Trashland a go go. Trashland a go go. Okay. Yeah. And now, now that I know it's all lyrics, I'll have to re listen to it again and just kind of see what other titles are there. Because I didn't realize there were book titles. I just said, wow, this is kind of different lyrically. And so I read And then, yeah. kind of like the chorus, it's kind of very catchy at the end, is you got mutant sex monsters being said, sang over and over. And I almost thought, why isn't this called that? But, you know, you said you, why well, you called it Rose of the Tentacle Pages. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and actually the chorus, I guess, is not the title of a book. That was sort of my, uh, oh. <laughs> just my, Whoops. uh, okay. <laughs> yeah, mutant sex monsters rise up and, and take over. I would have people sing along with it as I was playing it. It felt really good to be leading this chant, you know, in a club of all these people singing, mutant sex monsters rise up and take over. Very powering. Hmm. So that that's the full album. So, uh, but I have a few more questions about it and everything. It's like uh, when you create songs, you told me how you what inspires you and stuff like that. But do you tend to perform them live in concert first to kind of test it out on an audience, or do you oh, yeah. just create it in the studio and just hope for the best? No, um, these it works much better if I can uh, play it on the road for a few months. Um, cause the, the kinks get ironed out of the song. Sometimes you learn that the song just doesn't really hold up. Um, some stuff works better in the studio than it does live, um, and vice versa. Mm -hmm. But I find it very useful 
to play it live for a while first. Mm-hmm. And there are just ones, I'm sure this has happened, but you, know, you, you play it and play it and play it, just doesn't work out, and you just drop it from the set, never recorded it and stuff like that? Yeah, there are some. Sometimes I will record them because uh, they can they can make for good records sometimes, even if they don't make for good uh, live songs. You never really know. Um, but in general, um, it, it behooves the song to be played before an audience uh, a number of times, I think, before recording it. And uh, sometimes the... the um, the vocal melodies especially will develop um the way you do it in practice sort of changes once you do it in front of other people okay and the the eight songs we played in today's show uh you're currently performing live no i think only a couple of those are still in the set oh wow uh, so you're on the new things yeah. okay <laughs> you know because i write new songs i don't maintain a really l- large set list like i couldn't sit down and play 50 songs for you i could probably only manage about 15 or 20 hmm. um so as i write new ones i tend to drop other ones also some of them i just get tired of playing um mm-hmm. and uh to keep myself interested i'll <laughs> i'll move on with new music i think you can also tell with bands like you see some of these groups that have been playing the same songs for 30 years <laughs> like dylan like when you see dylan play and he plays like rolling stone he doesn't it just doesn't seem like he's that into it he kind of rushes through the words and it doesn't have the same you know vibe that his newer stuff will yeah. That's, that was my impression anyway well as I, much as I, I actually saw stuff. dylan a couple years ago and uh, i will tell you the truth he didn't do any old stuff. And so I, I, I tell people, it, because people said, oh, I've always wanted to see Dylan. And I said, well, if you go to Dylan nowadays and you expect him to play like a Rolling Stone and uh, any of his old stuff from the early 60s, forget it. I mean, the oldest song he played, he played Tired of Midnight Blue from the 70s. But everything else was uh, current, like in the last 10 years. So if you didn't know his current stuff, you might be bored, you know, and he doesn't really talk to the audience, so uh, <laughs> it was very interesting. I'm glad I saw him, but it was like, it was kind of bizarre, you know, it was like, I thought he would just do a, a few older songs just to kind of whet the appetite, but now nah, he doesn't bother. He's not like, say, McCartney or the Rolling Stones, where it's like, oh, here we go playing Satisfaction again, you know, it's like... <laughs> So yeah, which in a way you can understand, um, because he's probably, you know, he cares about what he's writing yeah. now. Yeah. Um, you know, I guess he's just not quite the showman that yes. <laughs> Jagger is, you know. When I saw him a couple times, probably about 10, 15 years ago, he was doing some older stuff, huh. but it was it didn't seem to have his attention the way the new stuff. And I think any artist, you know, that's an element there. Like sometimes I'll bring back a song that I haven't done for a number of years that's old, and I'll be kind of like, ooh, I like this one, this is fun. Mm-hmm. But after doing it for a year or two, uh, continuously, I'll sort of wear myself out on it. Right. But you don't really have like a, a satisfaction or blowing in the wind or something like that that you know, we no, have to hear that thing. song, you know, or I, we're, we're... I do have one kind of where the song Hot Rod Worm, um, my video of it has gotten something like 10,000 views. Okay. And people that do know who I am tend to know that song and I think would be a little disappointed if I didn't play it. Okay, and it's so a you do song have a song. That's cool. Yeah, because so, I was wondering, does the set list completely change or do you keep a couple old chestnuts just for anybody who liked them or whatever (laughs) yeah i think that's the only must play that i've got um and but interestingly like i was practicing today and i didn't practice that one because i just couldn't bear to play it again right now you know (laughs) Well, do, do you ever do anything in, like, completely different arrangements? Some people do that because, you know, who would know? I mean, if you just decided right. to do do a totally different version of it, you know, let's make it more punk or let's make it more, you know, I don't know. A little bit, yeah. I'm not a great musician, so it's not like I could, oh, let's change the key or let's change <laughs> the time signature or the tempo. I'm just not that kind of guy. Okay. Um, I will play around a little bit, like, the vocal stuff is easy to change where you know maybe i'll sing it a little lower or do the whole thing maybe a little slower Mm -hmm. but um not a not a radical reinvention Mm, okay 
All right. Well, now I guess it's time to wrap everything up. Uh, so it's the the proverbial plug time. So I mean, uh, uh, I guess plug your freaky, plug your books, plug your uh, comics, plug your <laughs> CDs, plug your 10 inch 78 <laughs> RPM records and cassettes, <laughs> and where you're going to be touring. So go ahead. <laughs> uh, yeah. I mean, you can find me on the internet. I think if you type in the Slow Poisoner, it'll come up. I've got a website, theslowpoisoner.com. Um, Freaky doesn't have a website, but uh, I post stuff on Instagram, I think under my own name, Andrew Goldfarb. Uh, Andrew Goldfarb and the Slow Poisoner, you put those together and you'll probably find me. (laughs) Um, I will be on the road this summer. I'll go through the Midwest, and um, throughout the year I'll be playing – in the Bay Area and in Oregon and Los Angeles and that kind of thing. And uh, that's, uh, I think that's that's about it, yeah. And any new songs? Always new songs, right? <laughs> yeah, uh, let me think about that. I've got my, my Climate Change, Punk Rock Never, Hot Horror Planet. That's coming together. <laughs> um, I've got a, sort of a sing-along epic called Crap Mountain. <laughs> so that's that's a good one. Um, I revived a 1928 blues number called Creepers Blues, which is about a man battling roaches and bedbugs. And um, I'm also doing a song inspired by um, a visit I had last year to uh, Galesburg, Illinois, where I learned a local legend involving a um, – Werewolf, Ooh. where a um, hundred years ago um, there was an accident on the train tracks where um, someone or something got struck by a train. And when the townspeople came upon the scene, they weren't sure whether to call a doctor or a vet. Mm. Thank you for listening, and thank you again, Andrew Goldfar, for being my special guest. Episode number 32 will be coming soon. If you would like to comment and or be a guest on this podcast, please drop me a line at funideas.mark at gmail.com. You can become a patron of Fun Ideas Productions, and if everyone listening just contributed $1 a month, that would be a tremendous help. Also, subscribe to my YouTube channel. This has been the Fun Ideas Podcast. This is Mark Arnold speaking. This episode is copyright 2019, Fun Ideas Productions. Thank you very much. And have a good night.